All right, so let's talk about the structure and physiology of cells, microbial cells. And uh, as we noted earlier, there are two general classifications of cells, prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Uh, prokaryotes are cells that uh, do not have any internal organelles, including a nucleus. So uh, I'm going to break this down into uh, the stuff inside the cell and the stuff outside the cell. In uh, microbes, uh, or at least in prokaryotes specifically, I should say, actually a lot of the more interesting stuff is outside the cell. And um, for our purposes, I'm considering the boundary to be from between inside and outside the cell uh, to be the, um, the cell membrane. So here you can see a, uh, a graphic, and I like this graphic because it's like half of it is sort of a, uh, three-dimensional cartoon, and the other half is a transmission electron, uh, microscopy image. So the other half is just like a microscope, an electron microscope image of the set. So it's, it's pretty cool. You can kind of compare them back and forth. Now, what are the sorts of things that you find inside or around? Um, all those sorts of things that I'm going to talk about. Well, the sorts of stuff you find inside are the genome, which you can see sort of here, which is where the DNA is kept. Uh, ribosomes, inclusion bodies, the uh, cell membrane, which is this thin layer around there, and then moving out from the cell membrane, uh, you have the uh, cell wall, glycocalyx, and flagella. And there's a few other things that aren't in this picture that we're going to talk about as well. Now let's start with this stuff inside. The most important thing inside the cell is the genome. Um, in prokaryotes, uh, at least in bacteria, the genome is usually circular uh, and there's usually a single chromosome. Some things are going to have multiple copies of that chromosome, but mostly they're going to have a single copy of a single circular chromosome. In order to really see the inside of bacteria, you need to be using an electron microscope. Uh, light microscopes just aren't powerful enough to see really good, like what's going on inside a bacteria. Um, so this is a, uh, uh, an electron microscopy image of a bacterial cell. This is actually one of my images over here on the left. Um, so these are some of the cells that I worked with. And uh, you see this kind of light looking patch here. Uh, that is where the genome is kept. Now, um, prokaryotes don't have any internal membrane bound compartments, but that doesn't mean that all their stuff is just spread all willy nilly all over the place. I like to think of, uh, of prokaryotes as being kind of like, um, like a studio apartment or, a, a, an efficiency apartment or, or something like that. Um, you're all probably sort of familiar with that idea. we have got like basically just one room and that is your only living room. Um, and uh, I think of uh, eukaryotes as being like more like a, a, a standard one or two bedroom apartment where you have different rooms with different functions. So in a two bedroom apartment, say, you know, you've got one bedroom um, where you, you know, sleep and dress. You've got bathrooms, right, where you do bathroom stuff. You've probably got a kitchen. 
where you cook food. You might have a dining nook where you eat food. Maybe you use it for something else, but it's a separate area. You probably have a living room um, where, you know, you have your TV. You might have an office. Uh, where you do your studying and you keep your computer and things like that. So different rooms with different functions. And the rooms are separated from one another with walls. So you know when you are in the office because there's walls there. You had to walk through a door. <clears throat> now... If you're living in a studio apartment, you've still got to do all the same things. You've still got to eat. You've still got to sleep. You've still got to get dressed. You've still got to cook food. You know, you've still got to do your studying and keep your computer somewhere. You've still got to have your, your TV and things like that and your, your entertainment. But you only have the one room. And chances are pretty good that you don't just, like, sleep Wherever you happen to get tired, you just lie down there and sleep, right? Or you probably don't just have a TV placed in, like, just a random area of the house, right? You probably have your room divided into different areas. Um, you know, you might have, like, a... a you know, maybe you have a... Sort of a bed area over here... Um, you know, with your, your dressers kind of next by, maybe you have your desk, you know, with your monitor and your, uh, you know, your computer over here. Um, maybe over in this side, you have a table where you eat in case you're wondering, I'm, I'm, I'm actually just basically using the, uh, the the floor plan for the studio apartment I lived in when I was a freshman. Um, you know, you might have a kitchenette with like a sink and a microwave, maybe a illegal hot pot or a, a hot the stove eating thing. <laughs> And, you know, maybe a, a couch. Over here and, you know, your TV up against this wall, right? So you got still got different areas, right? You got uh, the, if this area where you sleep, this area where you do work. This is your table where you're going to eat. This is where you make food. This is where you relax, right? Different areas devoted to different things. You've got probably pretty much the same areas that you would in a multi-bedroom apartment. The difference is that you don't really have walls in between them, and so things are likely to get a little bit fuzzy around the edges. All right? Um, you know, maybe your clothes kind of spill out, and, you know, they might get left kind of anywhere. And um, You know, sometimes you probably do a lot of eating on the couch. You know, maybe uh, sometimes you take your laptop over and work on the couch, right? You know, there's no walls any place, so things are necessarily going to blend a little bit more. But you still have to have those different compartments. Why did I just spend five minutes talking about an apartment? <laughs> well, it's the same in bacteria. It's a prokaryote, right? It doesn't have any internal membranes, so it doesn't have those internal rooms, like organelles, where it can separate different functions out to. But it still has to do all of those functions. And for the most part, those functions still have to take place in a specific area. They're not just spread out throughout the entire thing. So the genome is kept in a specific area. Called... The nucleoid. And it's not the nucleus, because it's not membrane fat, but it is where the nuclear material is kept. Um, you would have different areas. If you have like an inclusion body, it's going to be kept in a different spot 
from uh, the nucleoid. Uh, you're going to have ribosomes in, in different areas. And in fact, the internal, or, uh, the internal area in a prokaryote can be just as highly organized as in a eukaryote. But the organization is a lot less obvious because you don't have these organelles that are separating things out. Uh, by the way, while the DNA is packed up inside of the nucleoid, it's coiled very tightly. Not quite as tightly as it would be in a eukaryote, but still very, very tightly. Um, like this nuclear material in the nucleoid could constitute like six feet of DNA. And here you can actually see, I didn't take this picture, but uh, this is a... Um, uh, a bacteria that's been exploded and you can see all of these strands coming out from it all of that is the uncoiled chromosome and you can see you can only see like barely a fraction of it here so there's a whole bunch of chromosome coiled up into that nucleoid space uh, another thing that you can find inside of bacteria are plasmids. Some bacteria have plasmids and some don't. Uh, we're going to talk about them more extensively when we cover bacterial genetics, but a plasmid is kind of like a mini chromosome, right? So remember I said the bacteria have usually a single circular chromosome? Well, that's true. They usually do. But it's not at all uncommon for them to have some, like, small other circles, which are not considered chromosomes, they're plasmids. They contain what's called extrachromosomal F-O-M-A-L, right? DNA. And the plasmid probably has genes on it that code for stuff which is, like, useful but not essential for the cell. And it's usually things that aren't always useful but are only useful in specific circumstances. So they're kind of like, you know, some add-ons. Some, uh, you know, extra bits of information that the, the cell has downloaded into itself. The material in between the nucleoid and the cell membrane is called the cytoplasm. And we often picture the cytoplasm as being like this sea of water in which the other stuff floats. And that's kind of true, but also kind of not true. Um, the, the material of the cytoplasm is actually about 50% water and 50% other stuff, proteins, small molecules, uh, energy stuff like sugar, carbohydrates, um, chemical signaling molecules, ions, things like that. All right, so it's about 50% water, 50% stuff, and it has a consistency which is kind of like a jello that didn't quite set properly. It's not entirely water-like in that respect. It's fluid, but it sort of oozes. Um, and the organization of the cytoplasm can again be very complicated. It isn't like it's all one thing that's uniform. The cytoplasm over here might have very, very different stuff going on in it than the cytoplasm over here. And they're kept relatively local. The things do diffuse through the cytoplasm, but not as quickly as they would through water. Floating in the cytoplasm uh, not everywhere throughout it, but most of the places throughout it, are ribosomes. Ribosomes are complexes made of RNA and protein. They're found in 
all known living organisms. Um, although there are some differences between ribosomes found in bacteria and ribosomes found in archaea and ribosomes found in eukaryotes. But they all basically have sort of the same function. They all have two subunits, a big one and a small one. And uh, they all bind to strands of RNA called mRNA or messenger RNA. And the purpose of the ribosome is to take the information on the mRNA and read it and use that information to construct proteins. So these are machines that take information from RNA and turn that, use that information as a blueprint to construct proteins. They're machines for making proteins. If you are a living thing that uses proteins, which all of them do as far as I know, um, then you got to have ribosomes. And uh, so they're, eh, they're pretty, like they're pretty big for being an enzyme, but they're pretty small for being an organelle. Um, and you'll find thousands of these guys dotting throughout a, uh, a bacterial cell. In fact, Um, like if you see those, uh, those images before, um, like each of those little black dots was probably most likely a ribosome in it. Uh, the last thing that I want to talk about that you're likely to find inside of bacterial cells or prokaryotic cells are what are called inclusion bodies. Now, you'll find inclusion bodies in some bacteria, but not all bacteria. And bacteria that have inclusion bodies don't have them all the time. Uh, inclusion bodies are waste and or storage components. So, suppose you've got some trash that needs to be gotten rid of in your cell. It's, maybe it's proteins that have died and aggregated or something like that, or it's some toxic material that you made as a byproduct, or it, it's, it's something that you gotta get rid of, right? You got a few ways of getting rid of it. Uh, one, you could just tear it apart into its uh, component pieces, and like that's the preferred option. But you can't necessarily have enzymes that just tear things randomly apart, because if you did, like, if you had an enzyme that would just tear anything apart, well, it'd start tearing apart the inside of the cell, and the cell would die. So, um, like, eukaryotes can have stuff like that because of their organelles. They can take those really, really dangerous enzymes, stick them all in one organelle, and then anything that goes into that organelle gets torn to shreds. Um... But uh, with prokaryotes, it's, it's harder to have just enzymes that are going to just randomly tear anything up. So some things they can process by just like tearing them up, but not everything. Um, and specifically proteins, when they start to go bad, they tend to aggregate with one another and form large clumps of proteins. And once they've done that, then they're resistant to proteases, which are the enzymes that tear up proteins. So, you know, that's one way, that's the preferred way, but it doesn't always work. You can also, um, like, kick whatever it is out. Now, bacteria have cell walls. So um, the only things that they can kick out are things that are small enough to get out past the cell wall. And it's going to be relatively small things, small proteins, small molecules, but big stuff. Um, and uh, some things that don't particularly like to go through the bacterial membrane, you can't get rid of that way. All right? So the third option. If you can't tear it uh, away and you can't just kick it out, is you want to stuff it all in a bin, right? So this is, this is the, 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 
the big garbage pile method. All right, so let's say that you have a whole bunch of stuff accumulating in your house. Um, it's like too big for you to easily get rid of. You know, doesn't exactly fit in the, so you got a bunch of moving boxes or something like that, right? They don't fit very well in the trash can. Um, you know, you can't really just like burn them to get rid of them. They're too big for that. What you do is you tend to just like go, all right, um, that corner of the garage over there, that's where I'm going to keep all the old moving boxes. And who knows, maybe they'll be useful later on. Uh, and bacteria do something kind of similar. They go, all right, well, we're going to just take all of this junk and we're just going to put it all in one place. Stick it all together and shove it into a corner where it isn't going to screw with anything. And that's what an inclusion body is. Some inclusion bodies are for storage. Um, sometimes, for instance, like ribosomes or enzymes that you don't need now, but you might need later on, will get shoved into an inclusion body. And then you can go back and you can take them back out if you need them again. Um, and some inclusion bodies, probably most inclusion bodies, are just trash. This is something that I got to get rid of, but I don't have an easy way to get rid of. So instead, I'm just going to shove them all into this corner. Uh, and they form these waste dumps. If you're wondering how the bacteria get rid of the waste dumps eventually, the answer is they kind of don't. Uh, what will happen is that you'll have a bacteria and say this bacteria has a couple of, let's see, maybe this bacteria has maybe three inclusion bodies in it. Well, um, how is it going to get rid of those inclusion bodies? Because now those, those things are way too big to get out of the bacteria. Well, what happens is that the next time the bacteria is dividing, it's going to put all of the inclusion bodies into one side. And then when it divides, you'll have one good bacteria and one bacteria that's just like full of inclusion bodies. And this one usually dies. But hey, at least you got rid of them. All right, so that's the stuff inside of a bacterial cell that I wanted to talk about here.